Right, should we make a start? Bit of order. Do come in and join us. Uh, fill in, fill from the front, and uh, and then when everyone else finishes their lunch, they can find their way in to uh, catch us back up. Right. Um, I hope you enjoyed that lunch. Certainly, when I popped up there, there was a lot of chat, and clearly there's still an awful lot of chat going on, which, of course, is what this event is all about. You catching up with people you've not seen before and meeting new friends. So that's brilliant. Success. Tick. Um, but meanwhile, we've also got some fantastic content to get through today, uh, this afternoon. I hope you enjoyed that romp through. And it was a bit of a romp. I'm sorry about that. But there's a lot of content to get through on the product side of things. A really, really interesting challenge that uh, the sector's got to try to really embrace digitizing and working with manufacturers to digitize uh, and standardize products so that uh, it's all uh, singing off the same hinge shoot, so to speak. Um, lots to talk about that a bit later on when we have a panel discussion about how we're going to do that. But right now, we're going to look at the second, uh, I suppose, leg of this three-legged stool, uh, which is around digital assets. And uh, we've got a fantastic lineup today of, um, of owners and asset owners and operators. So. Um, uh, let's just kick off. We're going we're gonna to hear about the, 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 the Norwegian Railways. We're going to hear about from the Norwegian Building Authority. And we're going to hear from the Norwegian uh, Public Roads Administration. But let's kick off and hear from Statsburg. Uh, Brendan John Slater, Head of Data Analytics, Analytics and Enterprise Architect, uh, who's going to kick us off and tell us what's going on in his particular world. So um, tell us what I suppose what you're going to uh, tell us how your what, what challenges you've got and what, what's facing you right now in terms of digital assets Brendan thank you hi first of all I think what I'd like to say is uh, it's an absolute privilege to uh, to be here today to be able to talk to you guys to talk to uh, a community that has been at the forefront of something that's close to my heart which is the digitalization for, uh, for many decades. Today, I'm going to talk about StartBig's uh, initiatives around our data and analytics strategy, where we expand the term data assets to think of data in itself as an asset. Now, let's see if I can uh, use the right buttons. But first, uh, a little bit about myself. Um, my formal education back in the day is urban development, and more recently, sustainability management and innovation. However, most of what I'm going to talk about today has come from over 25 years experience in the technology industry as project manager, as product management, software development, strategy and organizational development and management consultancy. I've worked in uh, telecoms, I've worked in media, public sector, and with a small amount of planning and a huge amount of luck, I've managed to be in the right place at the right time in a number of major transformations and waves that have happened over the last few years. And I do stress the look aspect with that. In the, in the late 90s, uh, I was working in London around the dot-com boom and learned to take, uh, with a pinch of salt, the uh, karaoke.com's claims of a viable business model, selling banner ads to people coming on for the pub and trying to sink. Uh, what surprises me now is that they never saw the underlying music streaming capabilities and how that in itself could be a business model. But that's another story. I worked in mobile apps in the, the mid-2000s. And the reason there's a date here, if anyone knows the significance of that, that was the death knell for anyone working in mobile applications, because that's when those pesky kids at Apple uh, notified us that their world was going to change with the uh, iPhone 1. I've uh, spent some time in fintech um, around the mid-2000s. Uh, and most recently in digital government. And I think one thing that as I've learned from all of this around, around data, around standardization, is that standardization is important. Standardization is an enabler for innovation because it enables interoperability, which allows organizations to build scale and use investments for innovation. However, what I've also learned is that we should have focus on the end user we should have focus on what the end user needs are. Working in product management, what we used to say was if any of us, we should love our products, but we should not be in love with our products. And if any of us felt we were, we would use the old uh, adage that um, the shopkeeper selling drills should not forget that the customers want to make a hole in the wall. If we do that, then we can keep focused on what creates value. 
So that was a bit about me, a bit about Startspig, if uh, for those that uh, that don't know us, we are the uh, the Norwegian government's um, building commissioner, uh, real estate advisor, uh, property manager, and uh, and developer. We have a huge portfolio. We have over 2,000 properties. Hundreds of those are abroad, uh, embassy buildings uh, predominantly. We uh, we have three million square meters uh, of uh, property space under management. At uh, at any one time, and now is a is a peak time for us at the moment. We have a uh, I have to check these stats. We have 5.5 billion uh, Norwegian kroners in uh, in rental incomes. And we currently have 12 billion Norwegian kroners in our investment portfolio. We're building some of the most significant buildings uh, in Norway uh, as part of those 100 ongoing uh, construction projects. And uh, we have 850 employees. And just to give you a taste, some of the projects that we are um, building commissioner for have a bigger workforce than our entire organization is currently today. Of Major significance to Norway is uh, a building in our portfolio, uh, the uh, Eidsvoll um, building, where the Norwegian constitution was uh, was ratified. We are also building the uh, new Norwegian government uh, area in downtown Oslo, building and renovating. We are also responsible for major global uh, cultural icons like the uh, the Opera House, as well as. Uh, buildings of existential importance, I would say, the seed vault in uh, Svalbard. But what I want to talk about today is data-driven transformation and our efforts to um, tackle this more holistically um, than perhaps we have done before. The background for this is, is this picture from, uh, from Mashk uh, about the uh, construction industry and where it plots on a line of digital and digitalization trends over the, over the course of the last 10 years or so. So you can see per sector, the amount of digital disruption in each sector. Right at the top here, you see financial, retail, telecoms, and media. And down here at the bottom, you see architecture, construction, engineering. I don't suppose that's any new, anything new for you guys. Um, but the question is, Okay, you, that's, to a degree, that's understandable. Everything about these industries to the right is information. It's easily, easily digitized. It's easy to see a transition toward the digitalized future. However, we shouldn't forget that down at the bottom here, there's, there, there's potential. There's an enormous potential. And you can say, okay, it's much easier to digitize a um, mortgage application than it is a building in concrete and steel. Well, then if you look at a, an, a, an industry somewhere up towards this uh, middle of the uh, middle section here, the mobility or car industry, that's pretty, that's pretty a viable product as well, pretty you, tangible, you can put your hands on it. But even there in the car industry, the amount or cost per car of digital technology that goes into that is forecasted to be 50% by 2030. Now, this is also taking into account the amount of investment that's going into the, uh, to the car industry to establish new value chains and supply chains in the shift from uh, fossil fuel to, to um, battery-driven um, motors. Um, now, for some of those who've maybe followed the news, there's also some dubious questions as to whether uh, the data in those cars is being collected and perhaps needs some GDPR uh, attention in the, in the coming years. However, the question is, what is data? What data do we need? And in Starts Big, just to stretch the imagination when we think about data, we need to know how high the snout of this glacier is going to be on the 6th of January in 2031. Now, why is that? It's because we're currently building the uh, Troll Antarctic Research Center, uh, or rebuilding it. Um, and as you can see, it takes quite a while to get down there. It takes quite a lot of time to build, design, and build this. And what we need to know um, in this project, it might, not be the 30, it might not be the 6th of January in 2031, but what we need to know is data that is gathered from a lot of different sources that you don't necessarily traditionally think about. And we are forced in our position, in our value chain, being responsible for design, build, 
maintenance operation to think more holistically about data and to think about data from the start. So if we take a simple, a simple life cycle, um, there's a myriad of data that we have to consider. At concept phase, we can consider life cycle analysis considerations. We can consider socio demographic and environmental analysis. We can think of new ways to engage stakeholders in their needs, both micro and macro. And looking forward, we can think about using data for predictive cost benefit analysis. If we think about design phase, we can think about using empirical, empirical data to inform parametric design. And we can also think about predictive cost, risk, time, quality assessment per design choice. When we have that data available and we use smart analytic tools to crunch that data, we can get these kind of insights. During the build phase, we can think about automated earned value reporting. We can think about continuous predictive project reporting. And of course, we can think about smart, secure, and seamless collaboration. In the use phase, we thought of building uh, automation and OT, operational technology. We can think about predictive maintenance. We can think about bespoke, uh, tailored environments for users. And there's evidence of that today, of buildings today doing those things, as you guys would know. And then in a reuse phase, we can take into account LCA considerations again. We can think about how social demographic trends uh, influence the potential for reuse in our buildings. We're also an advisor to the state for office locations. And we can think about automated reuse design concepts. So the point here is that we have to think about data in a life cycle and in an ecosystem. And in the same way that we start to think now about buildings and reuse and building life cycle, we have to think about the same about data. We have to see data in its context. We have to see data in its relations with other uh, data. And we have to see it from a life cycle perspective. Only then can we get the most out of it. But this demands something of us. This demands that we think about data first. And this coming back to what some of the things that I've learned in the past is what is the problem that we're trying to solve? Instead of having a hammer and going looking for a nail, we have to think, why do those two pieces of wood need to hang together? Is there a reason for that? Can we think differently? So the whole ethos of how we approach data now and how we want to approach data in StartBig is thinking about what is the problem or opportunity we're trying to, trying to solve or exploit. The next step is to think about the data that we need to solve that whether that's our own, whether it's externally, or whether it doesn't even exist today, but might at some point in the future. Then we have to perform some analysis. And this is where, with, uh, with the right sort of competence and capabilities, that we're able to start to use AI and ML to be able to really get the most out of that data and drive insights out of that data that the human brain can't in itself. And the reason for this is that we want to take better decisions, and better decisions at a micro level from building automation and, and the HVAC systems to strategic level on how we advise the state, for example, whether they should build new or whether they should rebuild an, from an existing portfolio. So what are we doing and what is our strategy all about? So our strategy, data-driven starts big. There's a nice bunch of colleagues here. I could have had this picture here. I'm not sure it would have appealed more. But the reality is, this is what it's all about. It's about people. So our, our intention is to help us create value from that data, to share it with the ecosystem, and to provide trusted insights. But where are we? The first thing we did was to find out where we were in Startspig. And if you see this picture, you don't have to read all the details. But basically, from left to right, we're talking about maturity. And from top to bottom, we're talking about strategy to operations. And you can see it's a bit of a snaky line that wanders uh, left and right and back and forth. And the reason for this is because we've had an opportunistic approach to our use of data. Now, we don't feel too bad ourselves, too bad about ourselves about this. It's not unusual with our peers or the industry, but it means we've got room for improvement because a more healthy line here is that you define your strategy and then you execute that such that the curve starts at the top right and goes towards the bottom left. And that's where we're heading. So our goals is to increase our understanding of the value of data. 
It's to enable an agile governance model that enables that transformation. It's to improve data quality. And all of it has to be underpinned by modern technology. So back to the people. So we talk about an ambidextrous organization. Uh, in other words, sometimes this is called bimodal or two-speed. And it's the ability for an organization to run daily operations and deliver on daily goals and, and operative goals, because that's what we're measured on. At the same time, we want to transform our organization. So this is what we talk about a lot with our data strategy, is how we do those two things. So the building blocks, we are developing a competency program. This will touch our entire organization to a, a greater or lesser degree, scheduled after business priorities. We will uh, implement an agile governance model. The governance model is all about what decisions are to be taken, by who, how, and when. And then when it comes to data, we talk about democratized data. And here we're inspired by uh, Zagani from uh, ThoughtWorks and, and the data mesh concept in that what we want to do, we want to go away from the problems and the paradigms of the past where you are data warehouse and a very bottleneck of IT resources that tried to deliver data value to the business without really understanding what the business was looking for. What we want to do in our data strategy is to push that responsibility out to people who understand that data understand the value of that data to the business and can take ownership of that from a quality and a delivery point of view. We've, def we've defined a set of domains. These domains are the building blocks of, to be able, they're matched against our capabilities and our processes. These are the building blocks that enable us to set standards, uh, requirement standards to each of those domains such that we can really deliver on that. And then the last is a cloud first data platform that will, um, we say cloud first, everyone has a set of legacy and we will have a transition to get there. But our aim is a cloud first data platform built on a modern scalable architecture with an API and microservices approach. That means that we can deliver data at scale to ourselves, to our partners, and we are a public organization within security and political and commercial frames. We have a duty to deliver that data to, uh, to our wider ecosystem. So that's what we'll do. So for us, this was a, uh, a, a really quick uh, run through of, uh, of how it starts big, uh, look at data um, and what we see. And what I would like to, you to take away from this is that we see data truly as an asset. And like any asset, it requires a life cycle approach, good management, good strategy, good maintenance. But that asset also lives within an ecosystem of other data assets. And to really get the value out of it, we have to see those two things in, uh, in collaboration. The second thing is to look at data, or rather look at the problem we're trying to solve. So again, avoid the hammer looking for a nail, and think, what is the problem we're trying to solve? What is the opportunity we're trying to exploit? And then use data to, uh, to help us with that. And then the last is about how you get there. And for us, uh, it's about four things. It's about competency. It's about building those core competencies in the organization. It's about governance and agile governance so that both maintains a long-term plan, but also is agile enough for us to respond because particularly this part of the technology industry is developing at such a rapid pace that if, we don't able, if we're not able to operate on two speeds, then we'll find ourselves falling behind. The third is democratization of data, push out responsibility, scale responsibility, scale value. And the last is a modern technology architecture that um, enables, enables it all. Whew, that was me. Thank you for your attention. Brendan, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Really interesting about the, 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 the point you make about competency. Have you, have you had to really build up your levels of competency? Yeah, ab absolutely. We're taking it in bunches at a time starting with the most key resources, but absolutely there's a structured program of competence development. Great. For, uh, we use personas as a way of kind of aggregating the competence in each. Great. Well, I'll pick that up a bit later on when we come into the panel session, but I think it's a really interesting point. Where are we going? Have we got the, the right competencies? So, Brendan, thank you very much thank indeed. You. Right, let's move on. Let's hear now next from um, Alan Bejic. Uh, Alan is from the uh, Technology Department at the Norwegian Public Roads Administration. Alan, welcome. Uh, similar question, I suppose, what's going on in your world? How are you digitizing the Rose Department of Norway or yours? Thank you. 
Well, that I will uh, say on my presentation. So. Well, let's hope so. <laughs> All right. Yes, good day, everyone. Uh, I will be presenting um, Driving Sustainable Forward, introducing Handbook R110 model basis. Uh, the agenda is as uh, follows. I will start with a short introduction. I will tell you a bit about uh, myself and my organization. And uh, then we move on on the story behind the R110, where I will explain um, how we do our model-based uh, projects as of today uh, and what have we learned. And then we move on to the new handbook, R110 model basis, where we take a closer look about the requirements of the new handbook. First of all, my name is uh, Alan Begich, and I'm a staff member at the Technology and Development Department at the Norwegian Public Road Administration, also known as the NPRA. Uh, and I mainly work at the um, uh, development and implementation of uh, digital tools and methods of our uh, model-based uh, road projects. So a little bit about uh, the NPRA. Uh, it is an uh, administrative uh, body and provider of national public services subordinate to the Ministry of Transport and Communication. Uh, our responsibility for national and European roads, as well as for road users and vehicles, makes the NPRA the most prominent participant in the road transport sector in Norway. Accounting for two thirds of all traffic our national and European roads make up the main artery in the transport system, tying our country together. And the NPRA is responsible for planning and building, operating and maintaining this part of the road network. But what are our goals? Our goals are set uh, by the government to the National Transportation Plan, also known as the NTP. Which, rep which represents the Norway's national goals for infrastructure. And those are an efficient, uh, environmental friendly and safe transport system in 2050, which means more for the money, effective use of new technology, contribute uh, to fulfillment of Norwegian's climate and environmental goals, zero vision for the killed and seriously injured, and easier everyday travel and increased competitiveness for the business world. So those are the national goals. And the good thing about uh, these national goals is that they are framed to support the UN's sustainability development goals. So from Norway to the world. And then we mo move on to the story behind the R110. And before we start, I will try to answer one common question, which I often get, is why do we go model-based? And then I will delve with uh, what did we learn? Uh, what did we learn um, by doing model-based? I see I have a screen here, so I can stand here as well. Great. So, why model-based? Uh, on the road to a better society is the NPI vision. And we believe that uh, by going a model-based approach, we can fulfill this uh, vision. Also, by going a model-based approach, we will also fulfill the national transportation goals set by the government. And as I mentioned earlier, the, the national transportation goals are formed to follow the UN sustainability goals. So the question arrives, how does the Norwegian Public Road Administration address to these goals? And here I want to introduce to two handbooks. Uh, one handbook is the name V770, and the other one is named R760. So these are the handbooks for the NPRA, Norwegian Public Road Administration. Handbook V750, uh, model basis was issued back in uh, 2012. And uh, this handbook uh, is, uh, of course, from, uh, from Norway, and it sets the standards for delivering model-based road projects 
to meet our national transport goals, objectives, and the UN sustainability goals. The handbook aimed to ensure uh, clear quality requirements for our basic data, 3D design uh, across all disciplines, standardized description for both objects and models, use of open uh, standardized formats, models as basis throughout the construction phase, and standardized final documentation after project phases. So what does this mean? Well, the Norwegian or the NPRA uh, is now saying that we are going to construct our roads twice. First, as the first step, as a digital construction, and then as a physical construction. And by doing it this way, we can identify, optimize, and remove errors before the physical construction, saving cost, uh, economical friendly, and more. So that is the handbook V770 model basis. And then we move on to the next handbook, which we use. And this handbook sets clear requirements for everyone in the NPRA, involved in the management of road projects. Uh, and it's based on relevant laws, such as the Administrative Act, the Planning and Building Act, and several others. So these are the Norwegian requirements for our laws. Here, guidelines are given for how all of our projects should be identified, planned, implemented, and completed in each phase of our road project. The use of governing documents is required for all projects in all phases. So we have a little box here. You cannot see it down, but these are the different project phases of our projects, and these are the different methods by achieving it, which follows our uh, methodology which then delivers the correct quality for our projects. So another question often arrives is uh, how does the NPRA establish an effective management model for model-based projects? So before setting requirements for model-based design, we must first address to the guidelines from handbook R760 road project management. This means first clarifying the road project goals, which are the social, uh, societal goals, uh, effect goals, and result goals. Uh, and these are uh, defined um, by the NPRA from the project owner and the project leader. And they are inside the project order, which is done on uh, each project phase. And then we have another document if I can move a little bit, which are the central management documents. So here are the project goals, the societal goals, effect goals, and result goals for all of our project. And these are mandatory. Model-based design should align with the road project goals and not the other way around. So by saying this, um, for the NPRA, uh, model-based uh, approach or methodology or, or BIM is not our main goal. Our main goal is to follow up on the project uh, on the project goals, the national transportation goals, and the UN, uh, uh, UN global goals. Those are our goals. Model-based design is a solution that can assist in achieving the goals set for the road project. The road project goals contribute to attaining the government transportation goals, which ultimately support the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And requirements for model-based uh, execution are defined in a project order and a document list for the tender documents, chapter A, C, and D. And model-based design is carried out in accordance with our contract templates. Uh, we were talking about uh, being open uh, in the previous uh, sessions, and uh, all of our data are open, and such as our contract templates. Everyone can uh, pull out of one of our contract templates, and uh, let's take example of uh, the template for construction contracts. 
This is how it looks, the tender documents. And to order a model-based execution of a project phase, chapter A, C, and D must be especially considered. On the chapter A, here you must, um, the project leader or the project uh, owner must specify the go uh, governing documents. Which handbooks are to be followed on this road project? Which are the, doc uh, the, um, the documentation that are going to be used in the road project? These are defined right here. Then there are the C uh, chapter, which are the special contract. Uh, and this uh, section should outline uh, the general requirements for the documentation to be delivered. So here we define all of our uh, quality requirements, uh, data format, coordinate reference system, uh, yeah, file names, documentation types, everything. Then the D chapter, uh, here we describe the road project, the assignment and the documentation that needs to be prepared and delivered. So if we are to, to order, a, let's say, a basis model, uh, then it needs to be checked uh, and it needs to get, give a reference to which handbook it is uh, referencing to. And then, uh, we can have the correct quality of our model based. The same principle applies to the disciplinary uh, models. If these are ordered, then we have the correct uh, models. We also have, uh, we have also in the contract specified how our result data are to be delivered. So again, if it is uh, ordered, then it will be full, uh, delivered to the AFCO Bay, uh, uh, common uh, CART uh, database <laughs> and um, NVB, National Road Data Bank. Sometimes there is need of having uh, drawings. So if it's if their drawings is needed for our project, then it is specified in here. And then the drawings are delivered. Uh, also, if you want to have, uh, let's say, the uh, interactive project uh, presentation, then that is also checked. And then we have, uh, let's say, story maps of the use Arcus. I've seen Asri is here, so very good. To sum it up, uh, these documents establish the goals of using model-based methodology on our road projects. And these contribute to following up on the National Transportation Plan goals and the UN Society environmental goals. So what did we learn? By addressing to handbook R760 and V770 for model-based implementation, we achieved the following. We reduced, uh, there was a reduction in uh, discrepancies in our contract cost. It was more efficient compared to our traditional methods. Pro processes became more streamlined and automated and fewer errors in the construction phase. It uh, introduced innovation to the market where machine readable technology made stakeout redundant. So before uh, we delivered uh, just uh, drawing based, uh, now we can deliver model based data to our entrepreneurs, which they could put on their vehicles, which uh, made staking out redundant. So already a, a greener future and more precise uh, quality of the road projects. But uh, we addressed the government transportation goals. And we have a lot of documents which, uh, which uh, says that we have followed the NTP goals. So these are Norwegian transportation goals. However, one of the main challenges by addressing to the government transportation goals was that handbook V770 was not mandatory in our project, leading to very quality in our model-based road delivers. We struggled to control the model data as they were frequently delivered inconsistently and were too project specific. The lack of a unified structure across our road projects hindered efficient portfolio management and reuse of data in different phases. Poor data flow between different software vendors was also an issue due to a lack of standardized open formats. We suffered large data loss uh, until delivery where 
this shed when we import it to another uh, software vendor. Uh, we often lost some uh, elements, and the shed had uh, different colors, and the software could not uh, identify what this object was, so unclassified object. The V770 did not sufficiently specify which property information a project needed to ensure that our model-based road project met the government transportation goals. So these are the, was the problem. And that, that's why, to address the government's transportation goals, the V770 needed to be revised. This meant create a new handbook that is mandatory for a model-based road project. The new handbook should meet our needs and address to the standards outlined in the handbook. And the new handbook aims to ensure our model-based project aligned with the main goals set in the National Transportation Plan. And the revision started in 2019. So, a closer look to the new handbook, the future of uh, the NPRA. It was issued this summer in 2023, and is the latest guideline for ordering, producing, checking, and delivering documentation in the NPRA project, uh, projects. <laughs> it mandates with shall and gives uh, recommendation with can and should. And the handbook builds on the previous version of V770 and introduces new types of documentation. And the handbook strongly emphasizes machine-readable technology. Uh, so, the new thing is information modeling for machine-readable technology. Uh, our handbooks were mainly written for human comprehension and were not machine-readable. So, if you give it to a computer, it would not understand because it's not made for the computer. So, what we did, uh, we translated the requirements for our handbook into a machine-readable format by using machine language. So, we used the uh, UML models, XSDs, and uh, we gave it to the machines, and, and I loved it. They understood it. And this allows for direct implementation into design uh, tools for increased efficiency. So, it led to standardized property information where following handbook's requirements, which means now our property uh, data are standardized following our handbooks, our requirements, our national goals. So the users can uh, pull it the, the values of the, the shed. Also, it uh, standardized conver conversion between software, no data loss, where we before had a poor conversation between software vendors. We can now import the UML XSD schemes into IFC or GML. And now the, we achieve a good conversion. And I'm soon done. <laughs> so this also um, gives forward to data flows in software, automated tasks, where the, the digital tools can now scan the information of a shed and place the shed in the correct models automatically. So more efficiency data flow. It also uh, standardizes analysis in software. And this is a new requirement in the new handbook. And we have different types of analysis in R110. One is to analyze risk tasks. So if you have risk information in our, uh, in our shed, which is now standardized, it will be presented the correct way which we want in the NPRA. We also have the degree of completion, which is something like similar from the MMI, which shows the, the quality of the data comparing to the different project phases or the, the tasks and so forth. Phase plan, how, we, how is this shed and the whole project going to be built in, on the different phases? Well, there's phase one, phase two, and then result. Uh, there are different types of analysis in R110, greenhouse gas emissions, noise, corridor and line selection, cost calculation, environmental consequence, social benefits, rig and ground, and much more. And this is the last slide. What we hope that this new handbook R110 uh, contributes to is innovation. 
And by delving deeply into the R110 model basis, uh, we're not just creating roads for the future, but also thinking innovatively, innovatively <laughs> and breaking new grounds. And this is the beginning of a journey where innovation meets tradition and possibilities are endless. And we live in an exciting period and we look forward to seeing the opportunities the future has to offer. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. Alan, I'm just, I'm, I'm quite intrigued because uh, there's, in, in that whole process, uh, in order for you to, let's get these numbers right, the, the R110 handbook, you discovered and been down this route that you had to change the fundamental 770 handbook. Did that require you to um, actually have to have go and negotiate with different departments within your road sector? I mean, yeah, what, yeah, was the, yeah. what was the, you know, what was the process? <laughs> <laughs> well, we need to uh, map off our, uh, our activities, maps. We need to see what were the laws, which were which, which are our goals. Uh, we were in uh, in talks with different companies, and we, uh, we we found out the 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 how the world works in our uh, our property information and how those are structuralized to gain the, that shared the support of the this, different types and so forth. So that was a whole learning process about how the market was actually using the documentation that you already had out there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no. So, so it's, a, yeah, so it's a kind of, it's, it, no, I suppose the, the, the point being that it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a whole kind of, um, yeah, as an organization, you're going through a whole process of change, yeah. bringing the market with you along the way. Yeah, we are, and, uh, and we are, we are, um, going heavily on uh, machine-readable technology, where we are creating the UML schemes, we are delivering to our, uh, our users, and they can import it to the IFC GML, and then it will be, will be built the, the way for the, which is correct quality for the NPRA. Great. Now, when we talk to the software vendors a bit later on, interesting things to get drilled in, drill into there. So thanks for setting out your process. Alan, thank you very much. Thank you. Applause. Right, from Rhodes, from roads to rail, uh, uh, Kristen, uh, Kristin uh, Lesbo, uh, manager for BIM and Geomatics at Bain, uh, Norway, SF. Is that, did I say that right? Bain, Norway, FF. Barn. Barn. My it's apologies. Norwegian word for railway. Barn. Rail, Norwegian railway infrastructure and there are, there manager. Was, good. Well, there you go. Uh, you heard <laughs> it here first. Kristin, tell us what's going on in the railways in Norway. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to stand here and talk about a little bit about a couple of projects that is very important for us at the time. Um, I'm going to take you through a couple of slides regarding the Norwegian Railway Infrastructure Manager. Uh, and then I'm going to just talk a little bit about uh, the status of BIM in Bonn Nord as it is today. And then I'm going to dive directly into the two main um, development projects that we have ongoing. This is some of the numbers for our company. We have built and maintained a lot of kilometers uh, railway. We are, have, of course, railways in, uh, in all of Norway. Uh, 15 terminals for cargo. 723 tunnels, and so on. We are divided into four divisions. Uh, the BIM and Geomatics department is uh, situated in the project development uh, division, where we have all the large railway projects ongoing. Uh, I'm also going to talk a little bit about using BIM going into operation and management. So, um, one slide. Uh, we started using, well, we have used 3D in, in, in railway for some time, but in 2014, we started a project called Intercity. Uh, that is, I think, 10 very large projects uh, with different plan phases. So when we started using models for that, we, we were going to use models for all 10 projects, different consultants and contractors and so on. So we needed to work on our uh, requirements. So we have worked a lot of the standardizing requirements, um, level of detail and so on. The status now is that, um, and also we got the BIM strategy approved 
at the CEO level in 2017, and we've used it for everything it's worth. Um, all our large projects uses BIM today for early plan phases, construction, building, and as I said, I was going into what is development project is how to use the models when we talk about operation and management. So we have used, have a lot of focus on um, the setting of the requirements correctly. We cannot specify what software vendors are going to use. We have focus on, on BIM competence, and that is something that we're going to keep focusing on. And of course, uh, we are, have a lot of focus on integrating other BIM software that the consultants and contractors use into the project management software. So as of today, we have a requirement document, only in Norwegian, I'm afraid, that describes um, how we're going to use or how we are using models on all our projects. Um, we have some older requirements. It's always a problem in the large public uh, company. Uh, when we have some new requirements, we need to clean up some of the older requirements. We are working on it. And we have also made it possible for you to read about the development we do on our internet site. So that was a little background. But one more thing before I go into the development projects itself. This is not something that we do just by ourselves. Uh, cooperation with other public owners um, or the industry is very important to us. We have uh, worked a lot with Statsbygg, Statens Veivesen, uh, being here today regarding, for instance, the ISO 19650. We are looking into the loin standard. We also have a, uh, have a cooperation forum called Samferdselsrådet have no idea how to translate that, but that means that the public owners for road and railway meets with the head of organization for consultants and contractors to inform each other and to try to develop things and standardize on behalf of the industry. We are also part of a Nordic BIM collaboration, which is the public owners for road and railway in the four Nordic countries lot of information that we can actually share and we have also specified uh, done specific work for instance we uh, put out a LOD report status report for the Nordic countries last year and of course we are part of building smart we have been an active uh, part of developing IFC rail 4.3 that's important for us we are hoping to have this approved in Bananur this autumn it's at the management level as we speak. Um, we are active in the technical room, client and owner room, and now also the infrastructure room. Almost forgot that one. And we are also part of the board in Norway. So that was a little background. So what are we doing regarding information management? We have two projects going on. Uh, the first project is called KIM. That's the name of the project. It's the shortening for Inf requirements for information modeling. The second one is called Epoca. BIM, uh, FTV is Norwegian um, for maintenance documentation. So this is two projects that we have going on at the time. I'm going to describe a little bit about both of them. So um, the last couple of years, we have worked a lot on, yeah, so we, we have, I won't say we have solved everything regarding use of BIM in our project, but our focus the last couple of years have been on the I and BIM information. The information requirements, what does, do we as a public owner need information? What type of information do we need for different kinds of projects and so on? And also, uh, we don't only build railway, we also build some roads and we build some buildings. So. When we look at the requirements that Statsbank has, that the, the road authorities have, and that we have, we found that uh, in best case, you can see it's overlapping. And in the worst, it's large gaps between the requirements. So what we did, we started the project KIM. Um, and the overall goal is actually to have standardized information requirements 
for all plant phases, for all the type of objects that we build and maintain. And of course, possible to have machine readable or automatic validation for it. So what we've done is that we have, in cooperation with Sotheby, they were quite generous and let us use the type of database they used for their requirement, um, requirements. So we are going through all type of objects that we build. The important for us on the left side is that we actually come connect it to the Norwegian standard where it is possible. But we also want to use understandable names. As one of my colleagues said, that not everyone speaks IFC. So we need to use terms that a project manager or everyone in the project will actually understand. And then, of course, we will have a description that describes what type of object is this. We use an uh, information database, um, but that is just a tool. The, most of the work is actually organizing, collecting, and standardizing systematically information. And the next step, I'm not, uh, I'm not, um, I, I know you can't all read what is this type, but I'm trying to understand, uh, I'll explain what it is. On uh, the left side, you will find all, all the objects. On the right side, you can see the green hatches. You can see this is a plant face. Um, the goal is that if I were, were a project manager on a project, I was going to build a new station. Then I could go in and say, OK, my project uh, in a detailed plan phase has deep, these types of uh, disciplines, this type of object, cross it off in the list, and then I can actually export all the requirements to a format that the consultants could actually put into their system. That enables it to actually have automatic validation when we receive the delivery for the project. Uh, if you notice, the last column is totally empty. That is the column for delivering to operation and maintenance. And that, this is where the second projects come in. Um, we have used BIM, as I said, for several years. Next year, some of our very large projects will be delivered, model-based delivery for the first time. If you look at our requirements today in Banenor, you will find that we still produce a lot of drawings. That is what we want to change. If you create models for planning, designing, building, and as built, so there is no reason why we actually should produce drawings as well. And that's also something that costs our organization a lot of money and time. So um, what to do? We used a lot of time to actually uh, find out what was the real issue. And we have created this Epoca program, which is actually an improvement program within Balnanoj. So that is not the Kim project, it's actually in the BIM and Geomatics section. That is something we run there to standardize BIM requirements. But this Epoca program is for all of Balnanoj. So what we are going to do is standardize the delivery for every project to maintenance, model-based, some drawings, um, and of course also standardize the information flow between the systems. Um, if some of you work in large organizations, you know that you have a lot of different kinds of software to do things. And normally things don't flow, information don't flow between the systems, it stops. So that is something that we're going to solve. So we, this is kind of a boring sketch, but I'll ex um, picture, but I'll explain what it is. We have a maintenance database for all our railway objects. So our first goal is, of course, to deliver the model with the standardized information to the maintenance department. Um, this maintenance database has been in use for about 20 years, I think. And it also uh, it doesn't divide uh, between what they need when they start to maintain something and what they fill out while they are maintaining something. So we're going through all 270 objects type, 
looking at all the information, finding out do the operation and building and operation division need to fill this out, our contractors, or uh, can we say that this is something that the maintenance actually fill out while they're working. We have incorporated pull down menus and we're going to put in standardized values where possible. The goal is of course to make it as easy uh, and standardized for our contractors when they deliver to us. And of course we want to have automatic validation. Um, so when we complete that part, we will complete it by the end of this year. We will have uh, standardized what we are going to deliver to the maintenance. Then the next step of the project is how are we going to deliver it? So we have uh, the Maximo system is our maintenance database. We also have a system called Omega. We have BIM models but we don't have any connections. So what we are in the process of acquiring now, we got the bids last week, so it's a very exciting period for us, is to acquire a server to, to enable this information flow between all our systems. So I'll probably be able to tell you more about that in a couple of months. Uh, of course, also we need a viewer because previously we've used other file formats, now we are using IFC and we need an IFC view as part of that package. After that, we will probably, we have, well not just probably, we will start looking at acquiring a system for a project information modeling system for all our projects. But that is probably a couple of years ahead. So when this Poker program is completed by the end of this year, at least the first part, what we are going to do, connection between Kim and Apuka is we're going to deliver everything to the people that work in uh, the Kim project and they are going to implement the requirements we have found and put it into the database so that we will have a uh, requirement database that enables all plant cases, all type of object, including over to maintenance. So challenges and focus. Uh, of course, completing the two projects that we have ongoing is our first priority. Both have a deadline for the end of the year, so cross our fingers. Um, and then starting acquiring a project information model system for us. We also uh, need to focus on other parts of information management. Now we are focusing on the information we have from projects to maintenance. We have a lot of other data that we need to deliver, for instance, to the geodata corporation in Norway and so on. Um, yeah, continue looking into the ISO 19650. As others have said, building competence in our organization, several levels of our organization is very important. And of course, continue to um, cooperate with the industry, like this, for instance. And also we have, as I said, I'm responsible for both BIM and geomatics. So connecting GIS and BIM is also something that we're going to start looking into seriously next year. And probably a few things I haven't mentioned or remembered. So this was my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Christian, thank you very much indeed. Very good. Um, for, for the record, I, I did actually do a Google Translate for Sanford Solvers Vada. <laughs> it means the Transport Council, apparently. Transport Council, which is interesting because, um, I mean, to what extent do you find yourself, I suppose, uh, trying to reinvent wheels? I mean, or, or, or are, you, are you bringing together more of a bigger community in Norway to try to uh, work with the other bodies? You mentioned a couple of them. You're trying to work with others to, to, to solve this problem. Yeah, and of course, this uh, transportation body council, as you said, that is actually where we actually are able as a public owner to meet organizations for the consultants and contractors, not mm -hmm. just one contractor or consultant. That is also important for us. And of course, I, uh, cooperation is very important, as for instance, as Building Smart and, and other bodies mm -hmm. to cooperate with the industry, learn from the industry, share what we do, uh, and then we get your information back as well. Rail's hard though, isn't it? Because rail, and my, my, my experience of rail is that 
for all very, very good reasons, mainly about safety, they're quite reluctant and resistant to change. Is that a fair statement? Yes and no. <laughs> Yeah, I think, uh, as of course, railway is old. We started building railways 1850 something something. Yeah. Uh, and part of the maintenance organization has their set of ways of working. But at the same time, we find enormous innovation in that part as well. Mm. It's got to get rid of the old people. Is that right? No, I joke. Anyway, Kristen, thank you. <laughs> What's well, an option, I suppose. But anyway, um, thank you very much, Kristen. Right. Uh, finally, uh, Irvin, Irvin Ruth, uh, Special Director of the Norwegian Building Authority. Irvin, many, many thanks. Um, tell us what's going on in your world of uh, Norwegian buildings uh, and permits, permitting. So, Irvin. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> Irvin Roth here from the Norwegian Building Authority. Uh, it's a lot of friends. Good to see you back home in my hometown. Normally, I travel all, all over the world to, uh, to meet you all. But this time I have not a building smart hat on, I have not an ISA hat on, and not an European standardization organization hat. I'm on the building, my home office, the Norwegian building authorities. So uh, yeah, complex to sort out maybe. Um, we are going to update a little bit on the building permit. Uh, I, I need just need to mention here a little bit that in the beginning here, uh, Oscar Nieto presented the, the, the European uh, a strategy for uh, uh, the green transition uh, and they have identified construction sector as an important part of that uh, and uh, he talked about construction product uh, if you were listening very carefully he mentioned the digital building logbook but they also part of this is the the, the uh, digital building permit so that is one of the three main pillars they are working on so i will give you an update of what we're doing in norway at the moment and which strategy we have and what are thinking around this is before I started and just need to if you have any clue what I'm talking about just a, a very short very short introduction to the Norwegian building uh, legislation we have a, a building and planning act which also uh, have been mentioned by some of my colleagues here from infrastructure I regulate also infrastructure part but I'm from the building part that's buildings um, uh, and we, in the, the building authorities, we have uh, responsible for three regulations. One is the regulation relating to building applications, um, process and responsibility. And um, the other one is the, the technical, how you build. Uh, and the last one is about uh, construction products. And the interesting thing with the last one there is that it's directly connected, more or less copy and paste from the European legislation. Um, so, uh, the first one, uh, a little bit about how this process are in Norway. This is a map we made in uh, the regulatory domain. I need to train to say domain, not room, uh, in Building Smart some years ago to, when we are, was discussing the processes in, in the different uh, countries, how we can communicate a little bit. Uh, and. Um, Mainly the part of this is that in, in Norway, the, the first uh, regulation that is on, about the processes says that the first part, the concept, what to build, where, and how, what to use, is uh, under uh, the authority control. That means that you have to ask and have permission from the local authorities to, to do this stuff. Then the next of this is privatized in Norway. So that means that how we build this is, uh, is a private uh, building control and all. So just uh, have that in, in your back head. And then um, if you go to the uh, construction, uh, how you build uh, the middle part of the regulation, this figure is telling you just we have performance-based uh, building codes in Norway. That means it, it is a challenge to make it um, uh, automatic uh, code uh, check and so on. Uh, and of course, this is the theory behind it, is how it should be uh, after uh, this uh, time being since 1997, we have a very good mixture of this, so it's not very straightforward. Uh, so this is the background we have, but this is uh, how the, the setup are. 
and also the last one for product is the, like this the, uh, just we are strongly connected to the European legislation. Um, so now I'm going to test a movie. Uh, is it sound? I ho hope this is should be sound to a movie here. When Even the English version. So uh, this is what is all about, uh, the, the billing application process. Um, we have done that for a while in Norway. I think we started uh, inspired by Singapore in 2003 or something, 20 years ago. But uh, we also did a lot of experience from that. So we started more or less from scratch to build up uh, the system from once. We have now a very agile approach to the, um, to, to the process of the build system. It's important to have the market with you. It's important to have the local authorities with you and all that stuff, and also other authorities and uh, all the government bodies. So, so we have built stone by stone. So, what I, we have is a saying in in our office that um, we have we think big, but we take small steps to build this and test it, and didn't work. Okay, then testing something more, and then. But now we have uh, been able to build up what we call this uh, highway for um, for um, uh, <coughs> for building permit up and running, and it's quite robust. Um, and um, uh, and we also have been able to involve much more um, uh, people to collaborate, or organizations to collaborate with this. So it means from here we have a start with that. Uh, we don't anymore, from the authority side, uh, give an, an, an application to the front end for, for making a, a, a billing application. That is delivered by the market. Um, uh, and we have uh, five vendors in the market. Uh, some of them is here today. Uh, that make the, the front end system to the users because they are closest to the market, they are closest to the new, they, they, they deliver product to the market and then are more updated about the user need and so on. We are not that close to the market in, in the authority. We are not that kind of organization. Uh, they are also connected to what we call a, a national company registry. We have the Gataster, we have all the GIS mapping system and so on, we are connected to them. Uh, the next, uh, which you heard, it was called the Fellestjens Bygg, that is the Norwegian name, but it's some kind of common services uh, for construction. Uh, and here again, all the public uh, uh, register and databases he, he connected and uh, interconnected and data flow between all the systems. We can just read and we can update and so on. Uh, here we also do what was mentioned in movie that we maybe is most proud of. I, I, I haven't heard of any other countries doing this. It might be, please uh, raise your hand. But we can do fully auto uh, digital uh, notification neighbors. No more paper, no, no more stamp in the post office or visit your neighbor, you can do it all from, from your computer and it works well. And we have, have had about uh, three, five, three and a half, uh, something more than million uh, notification done so far. And that is quite a success actually. And we also, of course, report to the national statistics about what is building and so on. We have also the red one there. 
is the first impl fully implementation with the other authorities involved. Uh, there is, we are in collaboration with uh, others, but we are they're not yet uh, ready to put them on the list, but they will be there. And then, of course, um, the other side, the, the local authorities, we have about 350 of them in, in Norway, the municipalities that actually handle the, the, the building permit uh, application. Uh, in the old days, they just printed it out on the PDF, even it was uh, uh, digital on one side. Uh, but they just printed it, and um, but now it's fully digital both ways. So that's the reason why we say we have this digital highway, and this works quite well today. Uh, yeah, and uh, about the notification I have mentioned. And the last one here, of course, when I hear on Building Smart Conference, we talk, what about BIM? We haven't mentioned BIM. There's no BIM. There's no IFC in here. Um, and there we, we have actually an uh, IDM uh, uh, application uh, or a BIM application. Uh, but the market did ask for it. There is no demand for it. So, and it's built on the old standard, uh, the MD XML uh, system. We consider to update it to IDS when that mature, but we also here need to, to collaborate stronger with the market. To have, for example, the software authoring tools. Uh, I think Autodex is in the room <laughs> to deliver the information we need, please, uh, and, and so on. So there is a lot of stuff going there to uh, to um, uh, before we can succeed. It. But we are not giving up. It will be there, uh, and the market will demand it in the future, but not today. Um, so about um, the next one here is about. Um, what we do with uh, uh, the, the technical building codes. Uh, we have been discussing that for many years. I think we had uh, 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 so uh, Suhili, he's from Singapore, is here. I think we have uh, borrowed the, the, the software 20 close to 20 years ago and did test it here in Norway, uh, how to test the uh, um, uh, BIM model against uh, uh, the building codes. And it was way too early for us. <laughs> there was no models in the market uh, which was good enough. There was no way to check uh, if the information was there. There was no way to nothing. So it's way, way too early. And But since then, we, the, the thought had matured that yes, this could be a good idea. Now for some years, we have uh, taken this small step forward and dive more and more into it. And today we have a key demand from the government that we should deliver this in the future. And now we take a step-to-step -step approach, which the, the technical people working with the building regulation within our office, the, the lawyers and also the government, is a part of this process to dive into it. So, so the, the goal for us is that we should need a technical regulation that is easy to understand. What we learn if you is easy to understand it, the regulation is also more easy to digitize them. There is something uh, about the structure. Um, and that it should be ready for, for digital use. So that is the, what the, the government asked us to do. Um, there is a one special thing in Norway, because I have seen other countries and others have digital uh, building permits. It, it, the system in Norway says, because of the legislation I, I, I showed you uh, in, in start, say that we are only going to give the, the, uh, the regulation on a machine readable way to the market. The market has to do everything else. That means that we will not del deliver any checking tool, a rule engine, whatever it is, the market has to deliver. So we need to have good communication with the market how this should be. But before we are able to go to the market, we need to understand a little bit more. So that is what we do today. We dive into this. And um, what we see in the, 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 the main challenge is, is that we, the, Missing definition and terms on properties. 
can be the same definition here and we have this other meaning in another place and so on. It's unclear requirements. The guidance document I, I showed you in the, this uh, triangle uh, in the, is uh, unclear status. Is it requirement or is it just a guidance? And uh, there are all, all, uh, all 700 of these uh, uh, pre, so-called pre-accepted operative requirements in the guidance document that we need to go to, should be. So that means that we're going around in circles now, diving into the system. We need to, and you know, if you if you change one word in regulation, it's it's in per, per definition a new regulation, then, then we have to go all the circle, you know? So, so th this is not, we can give this to a software company and then you have a new regulation. Um, so this is the cha um, uh, challenge we have and all authorities we have, you heard about the Nord, Stalsberg, they just do it themselves, we can't do that. So uh, that is the main challenge we have. So yeah, this is uh, shortly what we want to do. Um, we want to the, the change uh, or develop um, our re regulation to support uh, digitalization. We need to work with the market. We need to give the data they need, uh, the regulations to the market. Uh, and we need to work together with them to, to, to and we need to test a lot. And, and we, there is no receipt to show this is the way to do it. It's not existing. Someone tells they have it, but they don't. It haven't they haven't tried to implement. The last minutes I will use on the last thing on the, on the products that this has to be a, a very oh sorry I, I'm I'm pushing here you know and I'm forgetting you but this is uh, what I said um, about the products we mentioned from before here they there is some strategy in Norway just very shortly show you from the industry actually about that we should agree on some uh, standards and so on um, and we need to agree on uh, 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 have a national database on on what they call product data templates build of these standards um, so from this roadmap the construction uh, industry must have these templates it should be available for the industry uh, it will build all these standards here from uh, developed by um, uh, um, uh, the European standardization and ISO in um, collaboration. Um, and what did the, the idea is here to uh, define the construction product only once. That means that they need to be uh, that the user should be able to search the properties for produ uh, products they need. It's, it's, it's the same we do every time in, in uh, when you go to a uh, 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 store on, on the internet to, to try to buy something. You need to agree on the size on the shoes and so on. And you, 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 you know what you get. Um, and we need to find a way to trace stability throughout the life cycle that had been mentioned with GS1 earlier today. Uh, and we also need to have a traceability of documentation that will enable reuse and recycle as a greater extent. As for example, this use case that has been discussed that uh, we should, uh, if we build something today, how do we find the information in 30 years when we're going to do something with this building? Yeah, um, and then support uh, the then I see there is red on the screen here. That means that my time is out. Uh, so I just skipped the last two slides. But uh, I think this is a an, an short update from the building authorities. I think the main, if, if you said something important you should take uh, with you is that the technical things that we do here in Building Smart is very easy. But when we try to implement this in a real organization, in regulation, in uh, bigger organizations that have a long tradition, there's a lot more stuff that need to be done that may be the complicated thing. So, yeah. So, so we have, 
yeah, I think that's enough for me. Okay, that's you can't call uh, me. Uh, well, let, let me ask you. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, but I let, see this. Let this me ask you a question. Yeah. Yeah. What What would you say are? It's very hard, very difficult. There's lots of moving parts. What would you say are the actual? great outcomes that you've got from the work you've done. I mean, who's, who's seen the benefit? You, you showed a picture there of the, of the user and how it's going to make their life easier. Is it all about them or are you seeing a benefit from this work? Yeah, if you go to the building permit, uh, I, I think it, it, I think obviously it's the user. It's m much easier to, to understand what to do and how to get an application. To, so it's, it's more transparent. Mm -hmm. But I also uh, think we now also see the benefit from the municipality side. They are um, is they can more efficiently use the resources in a better way. So I think it's a win-win situation. Are you getting better designs? Are you getting better buildings? Are you getting uh, is that is that is that a goal? Uh, the, uh, we hope for better building, of course. <laughs> <laughs> the design is a discussion, ongoing discussion. Yeah. No, no, because it's quite interesting because it's you know it, it's got to be more than just an academic exercise of doing. This. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We need to use our resources much better. We can't continue to do. Uh, you know, there is a, a bigger discussions. We need to move resources from the construction industry to other part of the society. So that's, I think, that's the high level goal. Good. No, well, it sounds like you got, you're, you're on the start of your highway. You're only just at the start of your highway. So, Irvin, thanks very much for sharing your journey so far. Irvin, round of applause for Irvin. Thank you very much. Right, I hope that's given you a, a good uh, a picture of the challenges that are being faced and the opportunities that are out there uh, by the, the asset owners, particularly around uh, Norway, etc. And, and I suppose a lot of their challenges overlay with what's going on around the rest of the world so uh thank you very much for sharing all those examples of you know actually how you're digitizing your assets we're going to go off now and have a, a quick uh break but after that we're going to come back and we're going to talk about digital workflows and we're going to have a panel session uh in which we're going to put some questions so uh, there will be an opportunity for you to put some questions to some software vendors so have those questions ready don't run away at the end also because right at the end of the day uh when we finish we're gonna have a large photograph here so you know, you're advised if you want to get in the picture, you've got to stay to the end. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, look, go and have a cup of tea, and I'll see you back here in, in uh, 25 minutes, 30 minutes, and we'll get on with the last session. But uh, don't forget the photograph at the end. Um, make sure you get your pretty side on when you come back. Thank you very much.